Okay, thank you for the invitation to speak to you. Um, I'm sorry that I can't be there with you, but I have some health issues that are keeping me here. And can you see my slides all right now? Yes, we do. Okay. So you've asked me to speak about the role that community pharmacies have played in elimination in Scotland, and I'll talk you through the steps that we got to and drill down into some of the details as the previous speaker has already um, done in for the, the project that was just presented. So we can think through what the, um, the benefits of using community pharmacies are compared to other pathways. And we have used multiple pathways as I'll talk about um, shortly. So, Let's first of all put things in context. Um, the Scottish Health, the National Health Service in Scotland is free at the point of delivery. So no one pays anything when they have contact with health services. And so it's um, there's no barrier at that stage. Our epidemic has been traditionally um, heroin and benzodiazepines, although cocaine and some stimulants are now playing more of a role. The delivery of addiction services within Scotland is delivered predominantly by addiction psychiatrists. These are psychiatrists who change as medics, but they don't have a physicianly background, which is the model in some other parts of Europe. So it's very much a psychiatric um, background based on that interaction. And in some areas where there's patchy coverage of psychiatry, the prescription and some of that uh, addiction work is provided by general practitioners. And so they're responsible for the opiate substitution therapy prescription. But the dispensing of that is done by community pharmacies. And so the pharmacies will um, be responsible. The pharmacists themselves are not employed by the health service. They are on um, fee for service contracts. And so there is an agreed fee for providing opiate substitution therapy to their clients and fees for other things as well. So that was the basis of how we are able to interact with our pharmacy colleagues because they're already on this fee for service basis. And so we could agree a fee for bloodborne virus testing and we could agree a fee for assessing for treatment and agree a fee for delivering therapy. And so as one of my pharmacy colleagues put it, um, I can see £20,000 walking in and out of my pharmacy each day. So if I do this, I get that £20,000 for getting all of my patients through treatment. So there is an incentive in the system that we have in the UK for encouraging community pharmacies to participate in this service. Some community pharmacists have the ability to be have in the UK have the ability to become independent non medical prescribers. So they go through a training course and then they can prescribe off a set list of drugs and hepatitis C drugs were added to that list. Not all pharmacists are independent prescribers, but those that are could utilize that and that simplified the process. We also have a system in the United Kingdom where we can have patient group directives, where a physician can describe a group of patients. And for us, it was a group of patients who were hepatitis C positive, PCR positive with no contraindications to therapy. And you can sign that group prescription. And then any pharmacist can activate that prescription for any individual patient who fulfills those criteria. So there are several methods that we can prescribe. And I'm aware that in other European countries, that liberal nature of prescription is not available and you have to have a, a doctor that signs the prescription, either signing off paperwork that they're reviewing or actually seeing the patient, which limits some of the possibilities for how we might um, deliver care. So the pharmacy pathways were one part of the part of the set of pathways that we used across Scotland. So on the left hand side of the graph of this uh, figure, as you look at it, we have the standard treat standard treatment pathway where somewhere in primary care, you're referred into secondary care and you're assessed in a secondary care setting, be that a hospital or an outreach clinic. In our pharmacy pathways, we trained most of the pharmacists to do dry blood spot testing and then treatment was either provided by a specialist nurse in reaching into the pharmacy or by the pharmacists themselves and it was the size of the pharmacy that decided which was being done if there were five or six opiate substitution therapy patients within the pharmacy we in reached into that pharmacy if there were 100 pharmacy patients or 100 ost patients within that pharmacy we trained the pharmacist to do it 
and there is quite a spread. So we have about 15 pharmacies in my region in Tayside that have well over 150 patients listed for um, uh, opiate substitution therapy. And then we have a very large number of pharmacies scattered across the rural and uh, less urban areas of our territory where they have only five or six patients. So there's that difference. We also have embedded treatment and testing within the drug treatment centers, and that's supported by an on-site in-reach nurse. And we use the same model within our prisons and with our, within our needle and syringe provision services. And so there is a mixed economy of testing. And I should point out that the pharmacy pathway came here late. And so the patients who are on opiate substitution therapy had had several years of opportunity to access treatment through drug treatment or through needle exchanges or through standard care. So in the DOT-C program, we did a sister, we did a, uh, a process evaluation and a series of trials to evaluate what would happen if we were to use pharmacies as a way of delivering therapy. The rationale for it was obvious. Patients who are on opiate substitution therapy have by and large been injecting drug users in the past and therefore are people who are at risk of having hepatitis C. And so it seemed obvious that we would reach these populations. And so we used the amount of opiate substitution therapy that was being provided in the pharmacy as the targeting tool for why we should target that pharmacy. First of all, we wanted to understand what the patient experience of the process was. And we did a qualitative study. And one of the um, quotes from that was standing outside the junkie's door. And so for many of the pharmacies that had um, opiate substitution therapy, they only wanted those patients to arrive at certain times and to queue up outside, not to come into the pharmacy unless it was their turn. And they were treated very much as second class citizens. And so this stigma and discrimination was a dominant experience for the people involved. There were issues about confidentiality because most of these pharmacies are small. They don't have individual rooms and people are well aware of what's going on um, in terms of when the queue of people forms. And so you can be spotted and not just from your family and friends point of view, but also um, drug dealers, etc., would know when the opiate substitution therapy was being delivered and would hang around in the hope of um, selling some drugs and scoring some um, money from that. So. Clearly, the experiences of care were fairly negative, um, but it did mean that the patients had picked up quite a lot of the knowledge of the mechanics of care and the burden of treatment. So we went on to do a discrete choice experiment um, to assess how people valued the different services they were involved with. And I think one of the dominant themes that came out of this was there was a fear amongst people on opiate substitution therapy of going somewhere new and interacting with new people, particularly healthcare professionals, as they'd had extensive experience of um, the stigma of that interaction in new environments. And so they were frightened of going to new places. And so we gave them the choice of um, what would they, how long would they pre be prepared to wait for a, a hepatitis C test? And to go to their own pharmacy rather than going to another pharmacy that they were unfamiliar with, they were prepared to wait four weeks. Their own pharmacy rather than going to their GP, they were prepared to wait for two weeks. And their own pharmacy rather than a drug worker, they were equally happy with either. And to be treated with respect rather damningly for our services, they were prepared to wait seven and a half weeks. And so despite the negative experiences that many of them had experienced with stigma and discrimination within the pharmacy, the pharmacy was a trusted environment where they were prepared to go and they were prepared to access therapy. And so that was reassuring to us in what we wanted to do. So if you want to start treating hepatitis C within a pharmacy, you need to make the diagnosis. So we did a small pilot study around dry blood spot testing, which we've used extensively as the main part of our um, testing platform because it's simple to do. You can train anyone to do dry blood spot testing and we don't use it as a, we use it as a substitute for venipuncture, doing PCR and antibodies from the dry blood spot test. So this was a quasi-experimental evaluation. So we trained the pharmacists and then allowed them to start using the tests on their patients. And you can see that in some pharmacies, uh, Pharmacy F, for instance, um, 
they did very little and clearly there wasn't the same incentive and the motivation for you know, the pharmacist or the technician that had been sent along wasn't feeling motivated to deliver the number of tests and in other pharmacies they were testing half their patients within four or six weeks of doing it. This is already a heavily tested population who had access to testing through their general practitioner, access to testing through their um, addiction workers and access to testing through a needle exchange if they wanted to, and they could also turn up on hospital asking for tests. And so this was an additional add-on, and within that add-on, we increased the odds ratio of um, getting a test by two and a quarter times. So in, a, in an enriched testing environment, there was still a benefit in offering dry blood spot testing within pharmacy. So you are reaching patients that previously you weren't able to reach. So we took that to the next stage and added in treatment as well. So in this pilot, we were teaching the pharmacists how to deliver treatment. The patients had to go and get some blood tests done to ensure that it was safe. And then they would have those tests. Now, 285 patients were untested within the cohorts of uh, patients on opiate substitution therapy within the two sets of pharmacies. And in the pharmacist-led pathway, 89 underwent dry blood spot testing. And in the standard of care pathway where um, patients were referred on, there were 63 dry blood spot tests referred. And three ended up with treated and one treated in the standard of care arm. Now, most of you are going to say that's awful. And the reality is was that this was a pilot and we were testing whether the system would work. And if you look at the what happened in the two arms, um, in both arms, about half the patients who had their dry blood spot testing didn't go and get additional bloods done. That meant going somewhere else, either to their general practitioner or to a local community hub to get blood done. And that didn't happen. There was a disproportionate number of genotype 3 patients in the pharmacist led arm. And at the time we were doing this study, our genotype 3 patients were still receiving interferon based therapies and so weren't being treated in the pharmacy. So those patients were treated, but were treated through our nurse led hospital outreach pathways. And there were quite a lot of spontaneous clearances, suggesting that we were detecting quite a lot of patients who were actively engaged in injecting behavior and risk behavior. A small number of deaths and then the numbers of treated are at the bottom. So what this pilot did was to demonstrate that it was possible for pharmacists independently to deliver treatment um, to patients, which is what we wanted to show. So we went on to do a large cluster randomized control trial across Scotland with in Grampian, in Glasgow and in Tayside and Dundee from where I'm from. So we had 28 community pharmacists ra randomized to the pharmacy led pathway about 1,365 patients and 27 community pharmacies in the standard of care where they were signposting towards testing. So they weren't delivering the testing themselves, but they were having the conversation with their clients and delivering their testing and, and signposting to testing. Whereas in the pharmacist led testing, they were doing the testing, sending them for additional bloods, reviewing the bloods, prescribing the therapy and monitoring them through treatment. And by the time we got to do this trial, we had interferon free therapy for both genotype one and genotype three, which are the two predominant genotypes we have within Tayside. And therefore we um, were able to deliver all of that treatment within the pharmacy. What happened? The odds ratio of SVR was twice as high in a pharmacy pathway as opposed to the conventional care pathway. And the big drop off was in the diagnosed and agreed to treatment arm. So in the conventional pathway, large numbers of patients agreed to treatment, but or agreed to diagnosis and treatment, but didn't go forward and do it because they had to go elsewhere. Whereas in the pharmacy arm where they were agreeing to being tested, they could be tested straight away and then engaged in treatment straight after. And so the big difference between the two arms was that initial diagnosis by using dry blood spot test and by delivering the test at the time the conversation was being had rather than driving people on somewhere else. There was continued attrition at each of the steps of initiating treatment and completing treatment, 
where it was much better within the community pharmacies, which is unsurprising because most of the patients that we were treating were attending the pharmacy every day to pick up their opiate substitution therapy. So they were being incentivized to participate in the trial, and it was harder for them not to do it than it was for them to do it, in contrast to those in the conventional care pathway who were having to go and attend um, a nurse-led outreach clinic um, somewhere in the locality. And so if you look at that in terms of diagnosed population cure rate within the pharmacy pathway, they were able to cure nearly half the patients who were known to be diagnosed within those pharmacies, either previously or currently, whereas the conventional care pathway only managed a third. So I think that's reassuring that it was working. But clearly this requires a lot of training from the pharmacist's point of view and a lot of commitment from their point of view. They get well remunerated for it, and so they are incentivized for it, but it's um, an investment in their time and effort in delivering that care. And equally, having pharmacists perform this role while it's legal within the United Kingdom, it needs contractual negotiation. And in other jurisdictions, it's probably going to be much more problematic to organize. So we thought about doing the REACH study, which was, again, based on patients on opiate substitution therapy, but it was targeting those uh, areas where there was a low volume of opiate substitution therapy patients, and so a small number of patients that you would end up treating. So by the time you became an expert in hepatitis C treatment, you would um, have long exhausted your group of patients. And also to look at um, those jurisdictions where you couldn't get the pharmacy contracts agreed or the pharmacies wouldn't stand up and do the, the role that you wanted to. And so this is setting a nurse into in reach into those environments. And so the model could be that you have your set of pharmacies that you're going to perform this in, you get the patients tested, and then you have a nurse sweeping through those pharmacies, clearing them all of infection. Um, the testing could be done by the pharmacist, and also the testing could be done by the nurses. We were using a point of care device, uh, a gene drive um, device, um, it's quite similar to the ones you're familiar with from um, the other manufacturers, um, from um, the name of which eludes me at the moment, the gene experts. And so those are the, that type of point of care device, which meant that the nurse could arrive into the pharmacy, offer testing to everyone that day, and then leave the prescription for the patient for them to have their test done the next day, or come back themselves the next day, do the follow-up bloods that are required, and then leave the dispensing of the, the prescription to the pharmacist and return in six months time to perform an SVR test. And so it took that skill build up that you required away from the pharmacy, but it meant that you could have a, a, a single nurse rolling through a large number of pharmacies, taking her his or her uh, kit with them. We performed the trial study in Scotland, in Wales and Australia. The pharmacies were randomized one to one to the intervention of the control arm. And in the control arm, the pharmacist would discuss opi opiate substitution therapy along with hepatitis C infection risk and direct the patients towards where they could get testing. The prescriptions in the UK were done by the nurses who were either prescribers or under the patient group directive. In Wales, that was also allowed to happen in um, Australia, this had to be done as a paper check by a general practitioner or a, um, a qualified prescribing doctor. And so that paperwork check was allowed as the way the Australians were able to do it. So we were exploring different solutions for how you get around that prescription side of things. Sorry, my slides not advancing on that one. Let's try that again. Okay, so what happened in the two sets of pharmacies? In the conventional pathway, 10% of patients agreed to testing. In the um, intervention arm, 19% agreed to testing. And the reasons were multiple. People saying that they'd recently been tested and they didn't want to be tested now because they didn't have time or were moving on, et cetera. Um, and this trial was conducted relatively recently. And so there had been a large number of patients already treated and not moved on. 
But the big difference between the two arms was of those in the intervention arm who agreed to testing, 97% were tested, which is unsurprising as the patient and the machine and the nurse were all stood there together. And so the patient didn't have to do anything other than say yes. Um, about a quarter of the patients who agreed to testing, which was less than half the people who were approached, um, went on to get testing and then have some intervention. In the intervention pathway, for reasons we can't explain, the RNA positivity was extremely low compared to the conventional pathway. The pharmacies were randomized. I have no idea why this randomization didn't work in this way, but that's, so if we look at new numbers between the two pathways, it becomes a little confusing. But if we concentrate on looking at percentages um, of those that were RNA positive, most went on to initiate therapy in the conventional pathway, but nearly everybody in the intervention pathway and most obtained an SVR12. In the conventional pathway, the SVR12 level was low. This wasn't due to a lack of SVR, it was just due to the people didn't turn up for their SVR tests. So we're assuming they, we know that they completed therapy, but they never came back for their SVR. And so overall, you had 95% achievement of that SVR as opposed to 50%, and the 86% and 80% who completed therapy. So again, you can see where that, as in the super.c study, in the REACH study, is that initial step and that initial getting diagnosis from the patient is the key part of this, and that's the biggest attrition step in all of these studies. So let's step back and think about the bigger picture for a moment. Sorry, this slide is slightly morphed out of shape. So within Tayside, we were part of an experiment to see whether we could up treatment levels rapidly and achieve an elimination level of um, treatment. And so we wanted to see how we could deliver treatment to more than 90% of our um, people who inject drugs uh, within our territory to see if we could then prove whether treatment as prevention worked or not. And to do that, we were going to use our pharmacies, our needle exchanges, our outreach settings, the prisons within our territories and our drug treatment services. And if you look at the six pathways that we used, you can see that um, here uh, the needle exchanges delivered 28% of the treatments and the community pharmacies did 20% of the treatments. So these two pathways delivered most of the heavy lifting for the uh, moving into treatment with a, into elimination. And so that rapid scale up from 200 people who inject drugs a year to 800 people who inject drugs a year in treatment was delivered largely by being able to upscale the pharmacies and the needle exchanges. And of course, the beauty of using that model is that these are not people that you're employing as staff. They are there within the health service already on a fee for service basis. And so you can pay them the fee. And once the job is done and you've eliminated hepatitis C, they're not your responsibility anymore. Whereas with our nurse led pathways, we had to train the nurses up and then we had a duty of employment to them afterwards. And so if you're thinking about this in reach and rapid upscaling of treatment to try and get the maximum benefit from treatment as prevention, you're going to have to train a workforce to deliver it all and then have nothing for the workforce to do afterwards. And so how you manage that afterwards is a challenge. And so using community pharmacies who have multiple other skills and multiple other things to provide for the health service is one solution to that problem. So doing that um, process of uplifting, this is a graph which is hot off the press and um, shows the results of the NESI survey. NESI is a survey that's done every two years across needle exchanges and opiate substitution clinics within uh, Scotland. It's anonymous and so it's random testing. Patients receive a um, voucher for participating in the study. And so it's a random sample of people who are attending needle and syringe provision or opiate substitution therapy. And it's been done every two years for a number of years now and is led by uh, Professor Sharon Hutchinson from Glasgow Caledonian University. And you can see in the middle set of graphs is Glasgow, Greater Glasgow and Clyde's figures. And over time, from a prevalence of 45% hep C antibody posit or PCR positive, this has fallen to 15%. And across Scotland, starting from our lower baseline, it's gone up and is now falling. And within Tayside, we've now driven that down to less than 3%. 
and those uh, three people, because it was about a sample of 100, have been treated. And so we're moving forward. So that rapid upscaling has allowed us to drive the prevalence down. We completed the upscaling in 2020, just as COVID pandemic hit. And that prevalence has carried on going down. We seem to have pushed it beyond the limit of um, regeneration, if you like. Clearly, there's a lot of testing going on, and we are retreating anyone who we find reinfected. But there's not the big bounce back that was feared with some of the earlier models. And so that scale up and using treatment as prevention does appear to be working. What does that do for our population as a total and how close to elimination are we in Tayside? The national chronic prevalence of hepatitis C was estimated at about 0.5% of the population. And for Tayside, that would be 1,975 patients. And so if we were working towards World Health Organization targets of a 90% reduction in chronic prevalence, that would be 1,776 people. Now, if we look through Tayside and we have records for everybody who's ever lived in Tayside, where they've ever been diagnosed either in Tayside or anywhere in Scotland, and we have ever diagnosed 4,535 infections in 4,322 people. Thousands of those were PCR negative. 700 of them have moved out of Tayside and are no longer resident within our area. 600 of them have died. And so that leaves us 2,031 infections alive and living in Tayside, or 1,878 people. And of those 1,778 people, 1,812 of them are known to be PCR negative as a result of treatment. And so we have, we have clearly surpassed that 90% prevalence, demonstrating that it is possible to move to those levels of treatment by using the pathways I've described, community pharmacies being a vital component of that, but one component, not the only component. And as your previous conversation was having as I joined you about how you focus that resource and that money to achieve what you want to do. This is clearly not me. There is clearly a much larger team of people who helped deliver all of that within the clinical services and contributed to the ideas. And I'd like to thank and acknowledge all of those. And I'm happy to take questions.